Hello everybody and welcome to FCS 1120. My name is James Roach and I'm the instructor for this course. This is PowerPoint 1 of 3 for week 1. We'll be looking at this one, so chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 5. In chapter 1 in this PowerPoint we're going to be specifically looking at food choices, why we make food choices, and then the associated sensory characteristics of different foods. Each PowerPoint will have a set of different learning objectives. Before you get started with each of the chapters, take a minute or two and just review the different learning objectives. Maybe jot these down. It's very important that you have a grasp on these main concepts because all of the learning objectives they are going to be related to what is going to be on the exam. So these objectives are the main principles of chapter one. So number one, it's important that you understand the different factors and overall complexity of what influences our food choices. So why do we choose to eat the foods that we eat? Number two, we're going to be talking about a lot of sensory characteristics. You have to be able to distinguish taste from flavor. Number three, identify different sensory characteristics that are used when testing and be able to distinguish one from another. So know what each means, know how they're different from other sensory characteristics. Making food choices is a highly complex process that many factors go into. We're going to first take a look at how different lifestyle circumstances are related to different food choices. What you're looking at here is Maslow's hierarchy. This breaks down different human needs into different category categories and then rates them in terms of basic to complex and which need to be accomplished before you can remain stable at a higher level. All that to say, before you meet self-actualization, you have to meet physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, and esteem needs. With regards to food choices, if somebody is trying to meet very basic needs, if they cannot get adequate access to food and water and a place that allows them to get an adequate night's rest of sleep, they're going to be using food to fulfill very basic needs. So foods that are high in calories, that are cheap and very easy to get a hold of, are going to be the top priority when it comes to food for people at the lower end of the scale. People at the higher end that are trying to meet self-actualization needs, who are trying to be the best versions of themselves, they're going to be much more likely to take a look at how food affects how they feel currently and how they feel over the long run. So people in the self-actualization stage are much more likely to spend a little bit more money on food if it's going to make them feel better and if it's going to improve their outcomes in life. Take a minute to review this graph. What this shows is how different income levels in the United States spend their money when it comes to food. At the very left, you have the lowest 
percentile of income. Middle is the middle 20 percentile income. And the right graph highlights the highest 20 percent income in the United States. And then the different colors of their income are associated with either restaurant, which is blue, or red, which is grocery store or foods that are eaten at home. Keep in mind that although the lowest amount of total money for food is spent by the lowest 20 percentile, that income, that $3,500, that comprises a greater percentage of their total income than the $11,000 that is spent on food by the highest 20th percentile. So the amount of money that is spent on food by the lowest 20th percentile, that is a very high percentage of their total income. And because they already have many lifestyle factors that are a little bit more challenging, this places more pressure on food selection. So food selection is going to have to meet very basic needs. It's going to have to be based primarily on what is most immediately important, which is getting enough food and getting enough total calories. People in the highest 20th percent, they can spend a lot more money on health foods. They can spend money on foods to eat out. They can really put a lot of their resources into food, and it's still going to have a less of a stress impact that it would for the people in the lowest 20th percentile. Take one more look at Maslow's hierarchy. People that are of lower economic status there's a much greater chance that they are going to use foods to fulfill more basic needs. Outside of economics, there are a variety of other factors that have a significant influence on the food choices that we make. And it's important to understand that there's a lot more outside of taste and cost of foods that we need to consider that people have to make when they make their food choices. So for example, people of different religious backgrounds may have different dietary restrictions. Some religions may require that certain foods are restricted. Some religions may require that certain foods are prepared in a certain way. The environmental factor, the people that you grow up around, the people that you live around, they are going to have an effect on the food that you eat as well. Consider a child that grows up in a family where they have a balanced m meal every night, where they have their vegetables, they have their grains, they have their fruit, they have their protein. When that child grows up, they're going to be a lot more likely to eat those same balanced meals and have those on a regular basis and enjoy those. People of higher education status, they're more likely to have a greater working knowledge of what nutritious foods can do for them and therefore they're more likely to be motivated to buy nutritious foods and eat them. Taste, convenience, and food cost have significant impact on what we choose as is the case with lifestyle circumstance. However, it's still good to take a look back and see within that realm what else is happening. Are there any factors in that that are happening as a whole in the United States related to us making food choices? When we look at nutrition, we can see that there is a significant change, a significant increase in the amount of money and the amount of focus that we are putting on nutrition based on the sales of nutrition-related goods and services. So if you look at 1997, you see that we have nearly increased three times the amount of money that we spend on nutrition-related services from 1997 to 2010. If you look at that blue line, that takes a look at the growth that has happened every year. Because that blue line, although it is stable and even goes down from 2007 to 2009, because it is above zero, that means that the nutrition industry is expanding and growing every single year. Within this, consider the restaurant Chipotle. 
That's a location that provides organic ingredients in a relatively balanced meal for a relatively low cost with very quick service. So they meet many basic needs while emphasizing the nutrition that they provide with their meals. In 2003, that company made a couple hundred million dollars annually. In 2014, they are making over three billion dollars and that growth is projected to continue to increase. The important thing to consider with that is that nutrition, especially if we can combine that with meeting other needs, can play more of a role in our food choice than ever before. If food services and food establishments can provide good nutrition with convenience, good taste, and a positive environment, similar to what Chipotle provides, there is a good chance that these types of businesses will be the most successful businesses in the future. This next section looks at the characteristics or the sensory properties of food. We can be affected by how others see food, how others taste food, how others explain a certain food to us, and the environmental context of that food. All those things can affect our judgment of that food, but sensory properties look specifically at how we process food with our own senses. So these are the five sensory properties of food. How do foods look? Are they appealing? Do they have good taste and flavor? And we'll discuss the difference between those two in the next slide. Do they smell good? Do they have a good odor? When we put those in our mouth, how does it feel? Does it feel right? Does that cookie that we eat, does it feel nice and soft? Or is it very hard and tough? Is the meat tender? or is it really difficult to bite into? And then also if we have sounds that are associated with that food, that's also related to the food sensory properties. Taste and flavor. They are often used as synonyms. For our class it's very important to understand that those are two different words. So taste, we have those outlined in the left column. Sweet, sour, umami, bitter, and salty. Flavor. Examples of flavors include chocolatey, chipotle, buttery, fruits, and many, many, many more. There are five tastes. There are millions of flavors. Taste is the chemical message that is sent to our body. It is very scientific. It is very concrete. Flavor is mar more so our association with what it is that we put in our mouths. Specifically, Flavor is the combination of taste and smell. Sweet and sour, that's associated with sweet and sour chicken. There is a sweet taste, there is a sour taste, but that sweet and sour combination, that is the flavor that is associated with sweet and sour chicken. It's very specific to that food. You cannot have that with any other food, but you can have those different perceptions of sweet, and you can have those perceptions of salty, but when you have that food together, you get the sweet and sour flavor. Another example, a peppermint candy that is sweet, that's its taste. The peppermint is a bit minty, or you could say minty sweet. In that case, the flavor of the peppermint is minty or minty sweet. The taste of it is sweet. Here's a little bit more detailed of an explanation of sensory properties. And this looks at the main sensory properties that we evaluate when we are examining food. So the appearance, what is the color? How does it look? What is the form of it? Is there any special design that's on it? Is it an attractive looking food? How does it taste? Again, taste just applies to the five main senses, sweet, sour, bitter, umami, and salty. How does it smell? Is it a good or a bad smell? And then flavor, again, millions and millions of flavors. It's a combination of taste and odor. And then texture. Is it a smooth texture? When we eat it, is it very sticky? Are there lumps in it? Is it grainy? And does it stick together? Or is it very brittle and break very easily? 
when it comes to testing these sensory properties, there are two different ways that we can do it. One is subjective and one is objective. Objective evaluations in include the measurement of the thickness of a food, the pH or the acidity of food, the color of food, and a variety of other methods that are not related to actually putting the food in our mouths. Subjective evaluations in that sense are more practical because it involves giving foods to certain people and they tell you what they think of the food, how it actually tastes, how it act all comes together. And then with that information, you can go ahead and adjust your recipe to create the more desired characteristic. One downside to consider for the subjective evaluations is that if the people test it, if they comprise a unique population group, or say they're a group of elderly individuals, there is a chance that their ability to sense different tastes will be limited. And a food item that most people may find very appetizing, this population may say that it is very bland. If the group being tested is a classroom of nutrition students, there's a better chance that they will enjoy a product with quinoa in it compared to a low-income population that eats many processed carbohydrates and has never been exposed to quinoa before.